All right, fantastic. So again, uh, welcome everyone to the September meeting of ANC 3C's Planning, Zoning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. We have a jam-packed agenda, so we would like to get started here with uh, the item of um, the Connecticut Avenue Development Guidelines. Um, and Heba from OP is here to give a brief presentation, and then we'll have uh, uh, Commissioner and committee member comments and questions, and then open it up to the community. So take it away, please. Sure. Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, thanks again for having me. And I don't really have a um, you know PowerPoint presentation, uh, but just wanted to give a verbal update um, on the status of the Connecticut Avenue uh, process and document. So um, the Connecticut Avenue Development Guidelines uh, have been submitted uh, for consideration by the Historic Preservation Review Board at their September session. Uh, so we submitted the document along with a record of public comments um, a few weeks ago in, in August. Um, and really this document is the culmination of a 14 month planning process um, with, with the Cleveland Park and Woodley Park communities. And um, as you all know, a draft was released back in April for a public comment period that ran through May 26. And during that time, uh, OP also presented the draft at HPRB's May hearing. Uh, and we, we heard a few comments from them, uh, as well as the comments we've received from the community. We went back to HPRB in August to provide them with a status update and share some of the ways that OP was revising the document based on those comments made by both the public and HPRB, um, as well as the uh, ANC's resolution uh, that was passed back in May. Uh, so thank you, of course, to, to ANC 3C for being such an active participant um, and, and for passing a resolution on this document in May. Uh, and what we're really looking for is um, HPRB's support of this document in September and um, their use of it as a reference um, as they receive development applications and reviewing those development applications against the guidelines in the document, as well as guiding uh, public space improvements and streetscape improvements that are as outlined in, in uh, the streetscape section of that document as well. Great, thank you. Um, I have put a link to all of the project information, including uh, the final document that HPRB will be um, commenting on um, at the, the next meeting, which is the 28th, right? The 28th, um, they can also, depending on how um, big the agenda is, sometimes they have a second meeting the, the week after, so it would be October 5th. Mm -hmm. The agenda really isn't finalized. Um, I forget exactly when it's finalized, but about a week before uh, the the September session date, um, they release a finalized agenda and it would show whether an agenda item is going to be discussed on September 28th or the overflow meeting, which would be October 5th. Yes, um, yes. And I'll, I'll put a link uh, to the HPRB website. Um, so for those who also want to uh, submit a written testimony or sign up to testify during the hearing, uh, you can also find um, uh, how to do that in that link. So I'll, I'll uh, copy that and paste it in the chat in a moment. Great, thank you. And um, Swali, do we have the, the comments back from OP regarding this on our website yet? Uh, I believe not. Okay, we'll go ahead and add those two. Um, what the ANC is looking to do in our next uh, regular meeting, which is next Monday uh, at 7 p.m. via the Zoom and will be noticed later this evening, um, is to submit a letter on the final plan. So that's what this discussion in this committee is uh, meant to inform. Um, so... With that, I'll open it up to uh, the committee members for questions, comments. Swale. Um, thank you, Heba. 
uh, since you mentioned our resolution, not that I, I don't know how many people read ANC resolutions, but given you given you mentioned it, um, is there anything in the resolution, given that the changes have happened that have made the resolution, that, that parts of it that we need to update or anything else like that? Like, or are the changes sort of somewhat consistent with what we kind of pushed for earlier? Um, just just looking for stuff that if we need to point out or anything else like that, uh, that, that you know of. Of course, we'll do our own, but I wanted to ask if you saw it. Sure, yeah. Um, I I don't believe so. I think we were able to make some revisions to the document to kind of satisfy some of the comments that the ANC had made in that resolution. In other instances, um, you know, we provided, uh, if we weren't able to make a change um, to the document itself, you know, we provide, we shared some um other external policies uh or other kind of district processes that speak to maybe some of the comments that ANC had made but um I don't think that that there's anything um I mean it's up, of course up to the ANC to whether to pass a, another resolution but right right um yeah no no I've seen seen the updates and really personally really appreciate the updates on social housing and and beefing up the equity section like you all did um, I guess the next question for me is next steps after this. Um, are you planning on uh, implementing the zoning change proposed? And what does the timeline look like for that? Um, right. So, yeah, OP would look at initiating zoning map amendments uh, for the NC zones for those commercial corridors. So NC 3, 4 and 5. Um, you know, in alignment with the comprehensive plan future land use map and the policies within the comprehensive plan, as well as guidance from this uh, from this document. Um, so I, I don't have an exact timeline. I mean, it's going to depend on what we hear back from HPRB, um, but we're looking at um, starting that sometime in 2024. Well, where are we? September 2023. Yeah. So um towards you know after after hprv i think we're, we're gonna determine uh a more specific timeline i think okay thank you that scared me sometime in 2024 <laughs> well it's i mean the process itself is usually a nine to twelve month process uh depending on how, how complicated those text amendments are um so you know even if we initiate those in we start that process in, in October, November, far following the HPRB, you know, um, that's still going to be a nine to 12 month process. Great. Thank you. Rick? Uh, thanks, Janelle. I, I have a couple of questions. And first of all, I have a thank you for meeting with us again. Uh, appreciate your giving up your evening. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, and the one is I, I went back and looked at the the board's report on um, of its May meeting. And one of the things it asked OP to do in the revision was to ensure that proposed relationships between historic one and two story buildings to infill buildings and additions be compatible. Can you explain a little bit how you went about that and, and how the uh, revised guidelines reflect that? Sure. Um, I, we we've done a number of revisions to the renderings to to better illustrate how kind of taller, denser buildings can relate to um, the adjacent uh, lower scale buildings. We've also added a cross section of um, kind of a a, a, a structural. Um, uh, adaptation to an existing historic building um, and how a larger kind of addition, whether on top or to the rear or both, can be incorporated within the lower scale historic buildings without, um, you know, while preserving the structural integrity of that building um, and how, again, that relates to adjacent lower scale historic buildings. And we've showed that through building cross sections, through renderings. We've also included some precedent images across the district um, of where that has uh, managed to be successfully accomplished um, in other historic districts as well. Yeah, I, I guess what I was looking for was a bit more explanation on how say a, a building height of up to, to 90 feet, which is what the revised report says it would be with a pet house, how, 
you know, you're thinking on compatibility with one and two story structures. I'm, I'm sure there's some thought in that. I just didn't see it in the, in the report. Again, we, we describe it through strategies like step backs above the historic buildings, um, as well as multiple other st step backs on upper story, uh, upper floors. Um, you know, we show step backs from the rear as well, if it's adjacent to lower scale buildings in the back. Um, and, you know, the structurally incorporating larger buildings within smaller ones. Um, so we've done that through descriptions of what step backs and setbacks, um, you know, uh, where they should occur and how through renderings and where that has happened through precedence. Okay, thanks. And the other question is if, if um, you're, so you're requesting that HPRB adopt the, your guidelines. So if it, if it does that, how would it then evaluate um, future applications? Would it evaluate those as against the guidelines or would it evaluate say proposed height as against the um, contributing structure and, and how would it sort of reconcile the two? Um, I think all of the above. I mean, there are other adopted uh, design guidelines by HPRB and HPO. Um, you know, we, we recognize that those are a little bit different, um, but, you know, similar to those other guidelines, HPRB would, well, first of all, you know, HPO would, would direct property owners and developers who do wish to, um, you know, uh, develop new construction or addition to historic buildings in those corridors to those guidelines so that they're um, kind of aware of them and they're able to incorporate these design strategies up front in their concepts. And then HPO and HPRB would be reviewing these development applications and, and look at how they've incorporated these guidelines within their design concepts. Okay, thanks. I know others have questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Bob? Thank you. Um, first, I want to uh, just say thank you uh, for all the work you guys have done on getting this um, plan to where it is. Um, there's a particular shout out uh, on page 19 of the new report that makes reference to um, how the the policy of the you know density and height um, for added housing here was set by the mayor and the council, and that you can achieve that through the design strategies that you um, outline there and then go through in the following pages. So I think that addition and call out is helpful. Um, so thank you for that. Um, th the question I had was um, after the May meeting, uh, I know the Cleveland Park Historical Society had submitted their own uh, commercial area design guidelines for, for Cleveland Park, not for Woodley Park, but for Cleveland Park. And I see that it's now an agenda item on the HPRB um, uh, calendar for the September 8th meeting. And I guess, and, and reading through it, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of similarities. Um, there are clearly some things that are, are different, but not like conflicting, but then there are things that are conflicting. Um, like, uh, you know, maintaining the low horizontality of, of the, of the commercial area and, you know, limiting building heights to um, what's 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 existing there now. That is in conflict with the development guidelines that you guys have have put out. So I guess I'm I'm just curious, what is OP? And I don't know if you can speak for HPO, but HPO's like position on how do you navigate these two? I guess competing guideline documents. Um, and, you know, obviously, that's obviously a question for HPRB, but at least from from your guys perspective, what's how do you how do you approach that? Yeah, so um, I think there have been other um, guidelines that have been developed by community organizations, and some of them are even linked to on our project website uh, or HPO's um, <laughs> kind of page within within the planning website, uh, OP's planning website. Um, however, we do acknowledge that these guidelines, you know, they're not adopted by HPRB um, and there is no commitment by HPO or HPRB to necessarily use them uh, in the review of development applications. 
but community organizations, um, you know, and community groups are are welcome to to use those. You know, Cleveland Park Historical Society. I think they review development applications and and um, as they come in as well, um, you know, and, and they can use these guidelines in their own review. Um, however, there is no specific commitment uh, by by HBO specifically to to review development applications again these against these community developed guidelines. Well, I, I hear what you're saying. There are certainly other historic districts have design guidelines. Woodley Park has design guidelines that was initiated and developed by the community there, went through the ANC, uh, and then HPRB approved them as guidelines to be considered. And so I think, I guess what I'm saying is it feels like this is on that same course. It's now on the HPRB agenda. And so if there's like two guidelines before HPRB on September 28th, does HPO um, and OP have an opinion as to, I mean, obviously you you want your, your work product approved, but if the other one also gets approved, it's sort of in conflict with the one that you're writing. And I'm just, it, it just feels kind of weird. Um, right. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be up to HPRB, whether they adopt them, if, if they do choose to adopt them, we'll want to make sure that, you know, they're not in conflict with one another if they are using both documents, in fact. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And just to note that draft that the historical society has out there has not been vetted with the community in any kind of public way. There's like no input, including from the ANC. So, and we'll be noting that in what we submit to HPRB. Um, John, I saw your hand go up and down and up and down. <laughs> Yes, it, it went up and then it vanished. So I put it up again. Um, <laughs> that's to follow on a bit with what, you know, the path that Rick and um, uh, and Bob were going down. What I read in your draft have been, again, I would like to add my thanks to all that you, know, you and and the team have done over the last, you know, getting on to two years now. Um, that... that the guidelines say pretty clearly in a couple of places that whatever individual project comes before HPRB, HPRB has to review that in light of HPRB statute. And that is what HPRB is going to be looking at. It, it can look at the Woodley Park guidelines and the Cleveland Park Historical Society guidelines and the OP's guidelines, but it comes down to what the people on HPRB think the statute means. And, you know, I have no clue what that is, but that has to be, you know, their guiding light. Uh, and these and these guidelines, which may be consistent, may be inconsistent, are just ideas. So uh, that's not a, com that's more comment than a question. Uh, um, I apologize. Understood. Yes. Great. Okay. Any other commissioners or committee members? I, I just had a follow-up question, quick one, but let's see if there are other questions before I ask that. We'll go ahead and then we'll open it up to folks in the room. Sure. Um, have I just wanted to pick up on one thing you said. Um, I guess you're contrasting a couple sets of guidelines, and you said there's no specific commitment um, by HPRB to review against, um, say, the the guidelines of a community organization. Um, is is there going to be an HPO staff recommendation here to that the board adopt OP's guidelines and agree to review applications against them? For the OP developed guidelines, you know, we've developed them ourselves, like OP is putting forward those guidelines. So yes, our our um, recommendation for HPRB is to adopt the guidelines that OP has prepared um, and HPO has prepared. Okay, so these are HPO prepared guidelines. So your recommendation includes HPO staff, is that right? HPO is within the Office of Planning. So yes. Okay, it used to be kind of quasi-independent, so. Right, and now it's within the Office of Planning. Uh-huh, okay, thanks. 
And we should also note that the guidelines that OP has put out were in consultation with the historical society as well. Like they were given a seat at the table to weigh in and walk through and, and all of that. Right. Right. Yes, that's correct. We've engaged with the historical society um, and, you know, Okay. The yeah, OP I, staff, I, I community planners, about. along with historic preservationists within the state historic preservation right, office, right, together right. we've I, developed these guidelines. I, would, I was asking about the latter. Um, I, I recognize that there are different groups that have weighed in with comments and testimony and other things. They're just asking what your understanding is of what HPO staff is going to be recommending. Again, the the guidelines are developed by the agency and the agency is putting them forward. So our recommendation for HPRB is to adopt our guidelines okay, that have been developed with the community. Great, thank you. All right, does anyone else um, in the community have comments, questions, raise your virtual hand um, or anything? Okay. I am not seeing any. Um, so again, thank you so much for your, your work and your time on this. Um, and like I said, we're definitely going, going to miss seeing you so frequently. <laughs> but I'm sure you'll probably we'll see me again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Great. Good night. Um, okay, so our next agenda item, which is really the brainchild of Commissioner or Tammy Gordon, our co-chair, who is unfortunately not here this evening, but is the formation of a subcommittee um, out of this committee uh, to kind of do a party planning for the, the Cleveland Park Promenade grand opening and project team thank you celebration. Um, so this will be better slated for when we have a better idea of when construction will be complete, um, likely November, December. Um, but just want to get folks involved in like ha putting ideas out there for what this could look like, what it wants to be. Even if we don't have a firm date, we can at least get some ideas and get some volunteers to start this conversation. So this is kind of our first, like, let's put the idea out there and, uh, solicit, um, again, hand raising from the community and, and in ideas. Um, I'm sure Commissioner Gar or Tammy would appreciate some help and, and some some thought. Swale? Um, yeah, I, I actually have a constituent that I've connected with Commissioner Gordon. Um, and she, she she's looking to start sort of a group that can look at landscaping um, on the on the service lane. She told me not to advertise it too much because she's still checking on certain things and she doesn't want people to get excited. So I'm not going to say her name, uh, even though she's posted it on a couple of listservs. You probably know who she is. Uh, but yeah, like I think there there are people who are excited to, in different ways about what to, what happens to the service lane. Um, so so I think you know it doesn't have to be you know, one particular way that you would want to help any way you want to celebrate the space is is perfectly welcome. Great. Thank you. Bob? Yeah, um, I missed the walkthrough um, that uh, I think Rourke uh, organized the other day and maybe some information um, from there we could, could share here about what, you know, what do we think, what are the next steps, what's happening in terms of, um, the promenade. Sure. Um, so the walkthrough was held with DDOT and the project team last Thursday at 2 p.m. in 100 degree heat. Um, it, I was melty. Um, and there are a good number of folks on it. A lot of uh, concerns were heard and um, will hopefully be actioned about the signals on Porter and Connecticut. Um, so there's that bit. Um, then we sauntered further down to uh, what was the service lane, which is now rebranded as the promenade. Um, and um, the the main thing that's holding up getting this done, by the way, it's 98% complete, is that um, the granite kind of bumpy pavers that were there to, and this is by design when it was designed in 2018 as a shared space between cars and pedestrians and other, well, cars and basically everyone else, um, is that the granite bumpiness was meant to be a visual 
and physical cue to both to all users that like watch out here, like be more aware. Um, but with the change of it now being a pedestrian, well, now being a pedestrian space, um, they had to go back and order thermal pavers to replace those, just those strips of the bumpies. Um, and unfortunately, the supply chain doesn't have those on demand. So it's taking a little bit to get them over here. And once they're here, then it's going to take two to three weeks to complete that service lane bit. In the meantime, they are commissioning like the lights and the signals and will adjust um, uh, accordingly. So keep inputs on on how comfortable that signal feels on pedestrians. Um, if you're held up a little in your car, it's probably because somebody's trying to walk across the, the newly painted uh, crosswalks. Um, so they're going to keep us posted on, um, you know, when they are further fleshed out with schedule regarding the trees and the plantings. Um, planting season is just about to start right now. Um, so there you will be seeing like trees and landscaping come back to the space. Um, so that's just a matter of outside conditions, um, making that be as, as uh, viable to make that as successful as possible. So I hope that helps, Bob. Two quick questions on that. Um, did they mention anything about the vertical bollards? And two, is there, what's the plan to stop car ingress, egress uh, by the two entrances? Is it just going to be the Jersey walls or is it going to be something more designed the, or permanent? It's going to be something more designed on the, um, the curb cut side. They don't want to go in and um tear up the curb cuts yet until the final design for the larger avenue is complete and then they can go through and do whatever they need to do or not do there so um they ddot i believe has like planters that they've used in spaces similar to this that they'll provide to stop to it won't be the jersey walls anymore it will be big significant bullying planters right um I the question was asked about those vertical bollards, but I was too far away to hear the answer at the time. So let me follow up and get back to what was said about those. Um, but yeah, I know somebody definitely brought it up. Um, good question. Thanks. Yeah. It was so hot out though. <laughs> uh, so really looking for the the shade in the trees to come back to the space. Um, Rick, you were there. Did you hear any of the, the questions that I couldn't answer here? No, I, I, I didn't. And, you know, sort of the group was spread out and then the walk got a little curtailed and disrupted at the end. Um, so I didn't hear a clear answer on what would happen with the bollards and whether those stay in or not. Okay. If one wanted to find out, who would one email? Um, the project team on that streetscape website. Okay. Jam over there. I can yeah. also send you yeah. her information, but I'm sure you, yeah. Great. All right. Anybody else from the community here have comments or questions on this agenda item? All right, not seen any. We will move on to the final agenda item for this evening, um, which is the discussion of the DDOT notice of intent on the conversion of two hour metered parking zone to 30 minute metered parking zone along uh, the 3300 to 3400 block of Connecticut Avenue. Um, so <laughs> DDOT put out this notice of intent um, in the beginning of August and revised the due date for um, comments a few times and they've landed on October 20th, um, which allows for the ANC to formally respond to the notice of intent. Um, and we will be taking that up at our meeting again on this coming Monday. Um, Swally is gonna have much further in depth uh, a question and comment period and present is there a presentation swally too or no 
Um, so I'll be putting some slides together with the history of it. And uh, there is someone, there's the DDOT uh, parking specialist over there who's going to explain some answers to questions. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your meeting time. So, but, but you know, I'm ha happy to answer any pre-questions people have there. There's certain things DDOT can and can't do. Um, I think given the emails from the community, you know, there's, there's a general feel, for example, I'm, you know, things, things like, for example, more accessible handicapped parking spaces, um, a little bit more diversity of parking hour time. So every, so not everything, but like they've taken kind of half the, uh, half the commercial area turned to 30 minutes, but there's been some talk about maybe needing some two hours as well as some 15 minute spots, some pickup drop off. So we'll have a chance to ask those questions and see what is possible. Um, you know, for example, I did learn something. I had, I had a meeting with them about like what can can be possible. I know that they're doing away with their pickup drop-off program. Um, this is typical DDOT. Anytime they introduce a good thing, they take it away. Uh, if for if you all remember slow streets, they did the same thing with slow streets, and they said, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna take this away now because we're this this was so successful that we we're gonna make it better." And it never came back. I think pickup drop-off, unfortunately, is a, is the same way. They're basically taking away the pickup drop-off program. So we have to like work with the um with the boundaries we have um but but yeah that's so i'll prepare some slides on that we'll have the specialist there he'll talk a little bit about the benefits of parking turnover how it can create more parking and things like that um so we'll we'll, we'll have a discussion about those things there but i'm also i'm happy to answer these questions here chair packets if you if you want me to or if anyone in the community wants well yeah and the, <laughs> i don't know that we can provide all the answers here but this is also the format where we as the ANC can take any kinds of questions that the community has and put it into our letter um, regarding this notice of intent. And the process is um, that DDOT has put this notice of intent out. The community and the ANC can submit comments and questions to it to which DDOT responds. Again, saying what is and with is not within their um, regulations, limitations, standards, whatever it might be. Um, and so, uh, and they'll justify it, right? And that's what would then be the plan moving forward is my understanding of the notice of intent, right? So I'll, unless I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, like they, you know, it's DDOT. They they don't have to respond. <laughs> they can, uh, but they have to take they comments. They have to respond they, to us. <laughs> they have to, and they, and, you know, but but it's always you know as as they respond they don't have to agree with what we're saying is what i'm saying like they yeah. they don't have to like agree with everything we say so um yeah i mean we have a chance to comment uh thank you chair Paggetts. i think you you know you talking to them extending the deadline i think was great so it's yeah we'll we'll see what happens but um but taking comments in from from anyone who wants to comment on it great thank you john yeah just had a a question um in the in the in in the notice from DDOT, they seem to be saying that they were doing this because that's what ANC3C wanted. And I know that was in your um, in your resolution about the service lane. And it, I suspect everybody at the or a lot of people at the time were focusing on the service lane and not on the, you know, the other paragraph in there about the parking. But why did you, you know, feel that if you closed you know, the service lane, these parking changes had to follow? That if you did one, you had to, had to do the other. Yeah, I mean, I think the first the thing is, and this will like this is part of the slides that I'm preparing. This isn't the first time we've asked for this. Like, this is no. something that we've been consistently asking basically since 2020 for them to reform the parking um, over there. Uh, this has like pickup drop off has been a big problem. Like when I go and talk to, um, you know, the the merchants over there that are mostly the service merchants, the dry cleaners, um, you know, any of the retail merchants, like they talk about how they would rather have cars moving in and out quickly rather than people parking there. I've heard lots of complaints about people parking and going to the zoo and not really like, you know, mm -hmm. and not really like, you know, shopping in our stores and stuff like that. So I think that's where this came from. Now, if I think so the way he got it. It's not connected to the closing of the service lane. This is just a thing. That well, it, it is. It is connected because once you close the service lane, you 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 lose spots, and so mm -hmm. you have to then use the spots you have left in a smarter way. So target 
towards more what the demand is. And essentially, you know, one spot, if the turnover is 30 minutes, um, within a two hour time frame, that's more likely to be a four spots for cars, as opposed to one spot that a car can take up and then just walk away. Um, or, or, you know, as, as the most part, like a lot of times, people who regularly work in our neighborhood, um, they might often park there for eight hours and take a full spot up. Um, that was also one of the issues. So that's, that's kind of where, where this, why it is connected to that and why it was in that resolution as well. Yeah, a number of things, yeah. You know a thing I've heard from a lot of, of the Woodley Park neighbors, um, some of whom have to drive to, to the business district up there, as opposed to New York constituents who who easily walk there, is that you know, 30 minutes is not enough to go to streets and the dry cleaner and you know, and the yep. third place, you know, whatever it is. Um, yep. So, no, I mean... Our, my constituents have said that too. Um, and I think that's why one of the things we're going to be asking is a little bit more diversity than they plan, right? Um, and plus, like I mentioned, it's not that all of the parking has been made 30 minutes. There's still two hour spots between um, Porter and Ordway. There's also going there, and, and there's also two hour spots um, all on the side streets. I mean, I, I live right you know, right on Connecticut and Ordway, never, never a problem finding a spot over here. Uh, so we are going to ask them for a little bit more um, diversity of spots. And so, uh, you know, that's, but I also think it's not that every spot has been converted 30 minute parking, like half the commercial district has just been, they've and not even converted, they proposed half of it to be 30 minute parking. Thank you. You're welcome. Definitely more uh, reserved handy hat two yeah. hour spots is yeah is those are the ones i think that we apparently missing from what we had asked in the resolution for them to produce and it's not there and we know it and that's going to be another push from us um, yeah the, there's only one spot there right now next to the library and, and that's and not even existing yeah. one too so yeah. yeah uh rick yeah um i know we'll discuss this more in the transportation committee but um i i appreciate that we're all thinking of uh you know, a more diverse and flexible array of parking spots, because I, I do support short term parking and, and turnover. Um, I think it's great, you know, if one is picking up a pre ordered meal or going to the dry cleaner. But the reality is that I've heard from members of the community whom that more handicapped spots are good, although many don't have handicapped placards you know, that, that longer parking is needed, say, for someone who wants to eat lunch at one of our restaurants, or as John pointed out, you know, to run multiple errands, whether to the dry cleaner or pick up a prescription or or perhaps then pick up uh, some food as well. So, you know, and, and having it in that strip adjacent to those businesses, it's important to have a variety there. So I don't want to be prescriptive on what that ratio should be. But I think it's good if we if we come up with a plan that reflects these diversity of of needs and time limits. And, you know, certainly there are other ways to address folks, you know, sitting in a meter for eight hours a day, too, regardless of what the short term timing the meter is set up. Yeah, that's that's fair, Commissioner Nash. And I think one way, at least I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying, just building on what you just said. One way I like to also think about this is that there's different people coming to the to the business district. There's people who are coming, like you said, for 30 minutes. There are people who are coming for two hours. And if we're able to diversify the options, then the 30 minute people will, will be able to park in the 30 minute spot and leave the two hour spot for, for people who, who need it for, for a longer time. So it also like right now, everyone who uses it takes up all the spots. Um, and getting parking on on the strip is, is, you know, people have said that it's difficult to like mostly, especially even for just like picking up, dropping off and stuff like Crack Daggery that does 40 percent of its business is um, is done through uh, through pickup. Um, you know, things like that is is why we're trying to to see why why we've asked in the past to, to do this. And there are signs and studies behind this that I'm hoping our uh, curbside management expert, which is not in the room with us right now, <laughs> um, will be able to to kind of add um, some of that, the facts. There are facts behind this. Um, Bob. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, one thing I would just add to the conversation is that you have to look a little bit more broadly as to what the impacts would be to have increased turnover spots on the avenue. Um, so I, I live 
I'm a Comb Street right off Connecticut Avenue. And people are constantly getting in and out of their cars and using side street parking as short-term parking, largely because there's not a lot of uh, short-term parking available on Connecticut Avenue. When you turn uh, those 35 spaces into short-term parking, you free up actually longer term spaces that are on the avenue. So if you're here for two hours and you want to be here for two hours, you have two hour free parking on any of these side streets. Creating the short term turnover spots on Connecticut Avenue increases the likelihood that you will find a long term spot on Macomb Street or Ordway or, you know, um, ad adjacent to the area. Uh, so, you know, it's 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 not just the the individual spots right there, but what it does to sort of the ripple effect to the surrounding park it, parking ecosystem. It also the studies have shown on, on kind of to follow on what you're saying, Bob, is, you know, people will say, well, then all these people are going to be looking for par parking are going to be trolling these side streets. That's not what's proven out. Um, by case study after case study. They're it's, trolling the side streets today. That's, that's, what I'm <laughs> that's not going to be anything new. No, but this becomes improved because you're finding the spot th that suits your needs faster. Yeah, and don't absolutely. have to do that. So it it's preventing, it's actually improving that situation rather than uh, making it worse. So... Important to note, I've been reading a lot about this kind of stuff lately, too. Embarrassingly so. <laughs> All right. Anybody from the community want to um, comment on this at this time? Submit something that you'd like us to include in our um, official ask to DDOT um, regarding this NOI? And again, the Transportation Committee meeting is Wednesday via Zoom at 7 p.m. Um, the information is available on our website and hopefully, Swally, can you toss it in the chat if you're able to real quick? I don't have it up. Yeah, I'll put it in. Great, thank you. Um, so is that the first agenda item on it too? Yeah, that's the first item. We do have a full agenda, um, but we're we're gonna try and give about 20 to 30 minutes to this. Okay, great. Thank you. So anybody from the community at this time wish to weigh in on this? All right, I do not see any hands. Anyone else from the group? All right. Well, with that, I'll call to adjourn this. Um, again, our September meeting will be next Monday, 7 p.m. via the Zoom. We will be sending the notice out later this evening. And we will also be following up with um, an updated notice, including any drafts of the resolutions and things on Friday, because we know there's a short turnaround, what with the holiday last week and um, this meeting coming in up next week and the committee meetings that we have this week. So um, stay tuned and thank you all for your time and enjoy the rest of your evenings. And some of you all see at 730. Thank you, Mr. Pegas. All right. Bye-bye.